Welcome, happy warriors, to another episode of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. This show is not a show for clowns and creeps and crooks and cranks. No, it is a show for happy warriors. Above all, it is not a show for tennis balls who float down the gutter of life. No, it's a show for happy warriors who seize the challenge each and every day, who struggle against the forces of entropy, who struggle against the forces of resistance that prevent them, try to prevent them from achieving their ends of improving their five Fs. That's right. This is a show for happy warriors, not for people who want to be massaged with warm butter. No, happy warriors do not need to hear only things with which they agree. They don't need to be massaged with warm butter. Happy warriors are capable of hearing tough information. Happy warriors, if there is bad news out there, want to know about it as soon as possible so they can begin to prepare their fortifications against it. Happy warriors delight and thrill in the fight against all those forces that try to obstruct us in our progress in improving and growing our families and our finances, our faith and our friendships, and our physical fitness. All of that is part of the joy of being a happy warrior. Now, part of the happy warrior equation uh, is family. And family means not only the little children that you bring into the world with you and your spouse cooperating and collaborating and connecting, No, it goes even beyond that. Family is siblings, if you're lucky enough to have, and uh, family is parents as well. And that's where things begin to be interesting. And I'll tell you why. In the uh, April 2023 issue of the Journal of Marriage and Family, I saw very credible information And I say credible because it's not just university studies and academic statements. There's more to it than that. There were interviews and surveys. And what's more, this seems to correspond to um, what I experience in my encounters. You know, I I am privileged to be able to uh, lecture and speak to many, many people. I speak at lots of different churches throughout the year. I speak at a number of synagogues, and I speak for many, many business organizations. An exciting one coming up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, in a few weeks' time. And um, I speak to people. There's certain standard questions I ask in one form or another, uh, hoping to be able to take the temperature of the audience have a sense of what's going on in this particular little corner of the culture. And uh, some of my questions revolve around family. And so this doesn't surprise me because what I'm about to share with you is what I experience and encounter in my conversations with people. Here is the point in a nutshell. About 20, call it about a quarter of adult children either are or have been estranged from a parent. That's just putting it baldly. Let's uh, let's dig down a little bit, okay? What this means is that uh, about a, one in four uh, people, and it's, it's talking specifically about uh, people in the age group from uh, 18 to 37, 18 to 37-year-olds, about a quarter of of these people are estranged from a parent. Now, my my guess, and I I could be wrong, and and you know I love hearing from you on the We Happy Warriors website, uh, 
There's a place to connect with me. And uh, as many of you have discovered, I not only read, but I respond. And, uh, and you can, by the way, you can become a happy warrior really simply and easily. Just go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, there you will do a little bit of searching in the headings and you will see how to join our community of happy warriors, derive the encouragement and benefit of being with others who are trying to accomplish exactly what you're trying to accomplish, and also discover the thrill of being able to help somebody else. Because life is much more exciting when you are a giver more than a taker. And through the Happy Warrior community, uh, you will find that there are people eager for your experience, eager for your encouragement, eager for your guidance and advice. So become a happy warrior. Join our community at rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, while you're at it, and I, I never realized that this is a, such an important thing, but I am very blessed to have on my team people who know a lot more than I do, and uh, I've been asked to make sure that I ask you to subscribe to this show. So whatever platform you're listening on, uh, there is always a, an, an avenue or an opportunity to subscribe. It's easy on Facebook. It's easy on uh, all, almost all the platforms uh, you can subscribe. And uh, that is something that works well for you and it works well for us. And on the off chance that you change your mind down the road, you feel it's not working well, you just unsubscribe. That's really easy. But uh, but meanwhile, if uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and uh, do us both a favor and uh, hit the subscribe. So, um, so here's the thing. So um, about 26% of people between the ages of 18 and 37 estranged from their parents. Now, uh, here's where it starts to get interesting, happy warriors. Do you think, you know, and what I liked about this, uh, this work at, uh, in the April issue of the Journal of Marriage and Family is that they were granular with the data. They didn't just leave, oh, 26% of Americans are estranged from a parent. No, they dug down to first of all take a look at whether the estrangement is the same. The estrangement figures for by estrangement means not talking to out of touch out of contact uh, we have listeners in many different countries and uh, i want to just make sure that if i use a word that uh, you with which you might not be familiar i just want to make sure you know what it means so instead of just saying oh about a quarter of americans between the ages of 18 and 37 uh, are have no contact they've separated they've isolated themselves they've disconnected themselves from a parent they've estranged themselves from a parent it drills down to see whether it's the same for fathers and mothers. Okay, happy warriors, what do you think? If you've been listening for a little while, I got a feeling you're going to guess this right. Do you think there's more estrangement from fathers or more estrangement from mothers? Or do you think it's exactly the same? A, B, and C. A, more estrangement from fathers. B, more estrangement from mothers. C, exactly the same. So what do you think, happy warriors, A, B, or C? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I, I would love there to be a way for us to uh, uh, connect simultaneously so that I can hear from you all as well that we could sort of do a poll right now and up on the screen would come the answer and I would tell you exactly what it looks like. But I can't do that and so we have to self examine each and every one of us ourselves. And now I'll give you the figure. 26% uh, are estranged from fathers. Only about 6% are estranged from mothers. Isn't that interesting? Makes perfect sense, right? Five, nearly between four and five times more people, let's say youngish people, 18 to 37, uh, more about four or five times of them are estranged from fathers more than from mothers. Okay, uh, I've told you in the past a, uh, a story, and it fits the story perfectly, I will remind you. And this was uh, told to me 
by uh, a terrific guy, the late Chuck Colson, who had become ensnared in the Watergate crisis with Richard Nixon. And Chuck Colson spent some time in jail when he came out realizing how dreadful the American incarceration system is and how ghastly uh, being in prison is and the extent to which um, Islamic indoctrination is allowed in prison. It is very difficult to get Judeo-Christian counseling or teaching or, uh, or ministering in prison. It's a lot harder. He started uh, Prison Ministries, which is, uh, in my view, a very wonderful organization, a fantastic ministry. And uh, what he did was, to just uh, quickly remind you, he, uh, he arranged for to send volunteers into dozens and dozens of American jails and prisons to help um, prisoners send Mother's Day cards to their mothers. And this was very popular and hundreds of thousands of prisoners um, joyfully participated and sent their mother's Mother's Day card, which turned out to have very good consequences in the recidivism rate and uh, in terms of going straight. It just had a, a good result. Somehow being reconnected with their moms had a measurably good effect. Anyway, he thought that was terrific, and so when Father's Day rolled around, uh, the late Chuck Colson decided, let's do this again for Father's Day. Got everyone lined up, volunteers, donated cards, postage, everything ready. Went into the prisons and discovered, and of course you know the answer already, that virtually nobody in prison knew who their fathers were or at the very least knew how to contact them or knew how to connect them. Some didn't know who their fathers were and most certainly were unable to connect them. The Father's Day card uh, mission turned out to be a disaster. Nobody participated. They couldn't. And and that was the end of that. So why is it then? What's going on here? Why is the connection with mom stronger than the connection with father? Well, you might say uh, it's biological. And sure enough, there's, there's a reality to that, isn't there? Because in the final analysis, uh, you know, there's no doubt about who the mother of a child is. Um, when it comes to who the father of a child is, we basically, you know, unless we're going to go DNA testing, we basically must depend on the uh, on the veracity of the mother and the integrity of the mother, because what she says, I mean, she's really the only one who knows for sure who the, the child, of, and sometimes, sometimes she doesn't, tragically. But uh, the father can say, you know, I'm I'm the father, but you don't know this. So that's one explanation that there's this deeper connection between mother and child and father and child. That's one aspect of it. But there's actually a lot more to it than that. You see, the relationship with our mothers is essentially biological, as I said, right? The relationship with our mothers is exactly the same as the relationship that a cat has with its mother and a cow has its with its mother and a camel has with its mother and a kangaroo has it with its mother. Exactly the same, right? The mother gave birth to the baby. That's It's as simple as that. The connection with the father is quite different because animals pretty much have no connection with their fathers. Um, I remember when, and I've told you the story of uh, the Lappin family llama, beautiful llama. Uh, his name was Lucky, spelt with two L's, of course. And um, uh, Lucky the llama after a uh, long time of uh, being part of the Lappin family, uh, we took him home back to the ranch from which we'd gotten him. And uh, the reason was that we discovered that it's cruel to keep only one llama. They're very much herd creatures. They need the connection with other llamas. I don't fully understand it, but um, I, I was certainly shown and taught that, and we saw it with our own eyes. Uh, our llama was so miserable, he sometimes used to lie on the grass in front of a uh, full sort of French door, a glass, uh, a glass door, and he would just lie there looking at his reflection in the glass, uh, in the glass door, and whether he thought it was another llama, I, I think he did because he was making noises to it, and it was just pitiful, and eventually um, our children joined with uh, Susan Lappin and myself, and we, we sat down and we said, 
it's as much as we love the llama and we love having him in the family, and he he really was a most delightful member of the family. Um, I shouldn't really say member of the family, but you know what I mean. He was a family pet, and uh, we decided to take him back. And um, we had made arrangements with the the ranch owners, friends of ours, that he was going to be coming back to uh, the ranch. And they said, oh, well, that'll be very interesting because his mother is in the herd, that we're going to release him to that herd, and it'll be interesting to see. Well, I, I do not know what... Um, naturalists and biologists and and zoologists will say to this. Uh, I I just don't know. I can only tell you what we all witnessed and saw with our own eyes, and that is that uh, we we pulled up. Lucky leapt out of our big van and ran into the meadow. Stopped, looked around, and then made a. There must have been about I don't know fifteen llamas in the field. He made a beeline for his mother. I, that's, that's all I can tell you. And it's been a long time since he last saw her. So I don't know. I don't understand. He made a beeline for his mother. And because uh, this llama had a, a bit of a, a registry, he had, you know, he had, it was sort of known who his mother and father were and who his, who his mother's mother was and his father's mother and father. Like, this ranch kept records because these were high-grade thoroughbred llamas, if you like. And uh, and so uh, we asked, you know, is his father here by any chance? And the ranch owner said, yeah, come here. And we walked through the herd, and they, they were all very friendly and tolerant of us. And uh, we walked up to one, and, and these uh, la- prize llamas all had collars around their necks, and the collars had little labels on them. And the ranch owner said, here, this, and he gave the name. I don't remember the name of the animal. But he says, this is uh, your llama's uh, sire, father. And um, we we tried to sort of walk Lucky over to see if he would sort of recognize anything in his dad, but wasn't interested, didn't want to know. All he wanted to do was hang out with his mom. And uh, <laughs> and it just, you know, and I, I used the opportunity to help our children see this point, that the connection between mother and child or child and mother is basic, biological, physical. The relationship between a person and their father, now that is something else entirely. And I'm going to define it as more spiritual. Yes, obviously the father provided some birth material and DNA in in the form of sperm, clearly, but nonetheless, it is a different relationship. And I mean, you can see the the difference, right? Somehow being um, held in the mother's body for a lengthy period of time uh, makes a difference for animals and for people, clearly. Uh, The father's contribution is momentary and passing, and that's the end of it for animals. And for people that have become, this is the painful part, for people who have become disconnected from a Judeo-Christian Bible-based tradition, from people who've been disconnected from a way of living that was first introduced to the world 3,000 years ago with the arrival of the five books of Moses, that idea that the father stays around and that the relationship with the father is very, very close and remains close and is very important that derived from that book. Now, you might say, you know, this this Rabbi Lappin is constantly trying to tie things back to the Bible, constantly trying. Look, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's like trying to say, you know, this Rabbi Lappin is constantly tying the um, economic welfare of a country to the price of energy, to the cost of its energy. yes. I do try and tie it there because it's right. It's a reality. Energy is so rooted in the core of the economy that when a government does things to allow the price of energy to rise through inflation, through taxes, through improvident foreign policies, uh, the result is it hits hard into the bank accounts of every single member of that society. And so I'm not trying to make a connection that doesn't exist. It's a reality. And similarly, uh, you can see 
that the prime correlation of uh, of uh, people who do have a strong connection with fathers and people who don't the prime correlation is religious connection now uh, this is true for uh, uh, judeo christian religious connection and uh, it's also true for islamic religious connection the role of a father comes from religion and that's why there is this connection our father in heaven now if you're very woke you'll probably say our mother and father in heaven both of them uh, or if you're even more woke you might say our mother in heaven but there's a very good reason why the tradition is our father in heaven and uh, this is a connection with our father on earth as a matter of fact uh, it is quite rare to find people developing a comfortable relationship with god if they never ever had a relationship with their father it happens but it's not easy so um, i'm trying to help you see or at least make the case for your serious consideration that uh, the connection with father is spiritual and uh, this is one of the reasons that um, in early european days going back even before medieval times the way that aristocracy identified itself as knowing who their fathers were and that's why baron von richthofen you remember the red baron the uh, the german air force ace the red baron from world war one or at the very least from your uh, peanuts comics um the red baron's name was baron i think manfred von richthofen what's the von richthofen um the german word von um means from from richthofen meaning from his father richthofen uh, and that word is the uh, is derived from the original ancient hebrew word the lord's language the hebrew word for a um, uh, for a son or son of we say the uh, two letters b n now in hebrew b and v right b for bravo v for victor are the same letter so ben or ven or ban or bon or ben or ven or it doesn't matter whether you have a b or a v in front of it and so uh, manfred von richthofen means manfred son of richthofen and that's exactly how it came to be used uh, in germany or in austria and also many other european countries in their own languages uh, because it was considered to be a low-class thing not to know who your father was and uh, as a matter of fact illegitimacy was uh, a stage further even right where um, you, you know you don't have a father so you're an illegitimate child and they use the word illegitimate because an illegitimate child could not claim uh, uh, inheritance rights from a deceased father right and and here i must admit um, i sympathize somewhat with uh, the president of the united states at the present time um his uh, his name is uh, is uh, biden and <laughs> did it look like i couldn't remember his his name well he is eminently forgettable other than for the damage that has been wreaked and inflicted on america but uh, at any rate so uh, he's got a son and uh, this son has an illegitimate child he had a short relationship with a um, a uh, well with with a, with a woman and um, the result was this little girl whom he didn't want to recognize and the press has been criticizing uh, joe biden extensively because when he lists the number of grandchildren he has he leaves out this child and uh, here I must say I somewhat agree with him because there is a difference between a legitimate child and an illegitimate child. Now I know, right? I I am not oblivious to the fact that the term illegitimate has been gotten rid of, and it's not it's not used at all 
Um, I, I do get that, and I, I do understand that. But nonetheless, the the word is um, uh, has meaning, and, and it does have value. It really does mean something, because being connected to your father uh, conveys a sense of legitimacy. And it's even more than that, a sense of bearing, a sense of dignity, uh, a sense of aristocracy, if you like. And so um, this is... Uh, uh, is is perfectly natural and perfectly normal, and that is why you'll find that in um, in America, for instance, it's not uncommon for families that view themselves as patrician or aristocratic or elite. They'll sometimes retain the names, and so uh, uh, you know, a son will be um, uh, you know John Proctor the third because they want to retain the family name. In other words, we know our line of descent. And that's the reason also that the name takes the father's line. Now, I know that there are some people who uh, take the mother and the father. So um, what happens is John Smith marries Jennifer Jones, and in a, uh, in a frenzy of egalitarianism, they decide to call themselves the Smith Joneses. John and Jennifer Smith Jones. And then when they have a, a kid, Jackie, uh, see see what I did there? Didn't tell you if it was a boy or a girl. They have a kid called Jackie, and uh, Jackie now becomes Jackie Smith-Jones. I'm not going to worry about what happens when Jackie gets married. But then they have another son, Vivian, and Vivian is now Vivian Smith-Jones. Um, okay, they're defeating the whole purpose. They're being very silly. They're not being serious. They're being silly. Because the, uh, the whole point, the whole idea is that there is value in being linked to the father. We never worry about being linked to mom because that's automatic. That'll always happen, right? Even in, in prison, and Chuck Colson told me about this, uh, the most popular tattoo was mom. Something, something connecting the guy to his mother is a very, very common tattoo, I asked him, how many tattoos have you seen connecting a guy to his father? And he burst out laughing. <laughs> and he said, well, there may be some, but I've never seen any. And I don't know about you all, but, you know, I when I meet some, where did I just recently met somebody with uh, a very impressive, oh, I, I remember where it was. Uh, he had um, tattoos on both arms and his shirt sleeves were not all the way down. So I saw, and then I asked him to show them to me and I asked the, the background a little bit and what they were. And uh, and I always do, but I'm always on the lookout, and I always ask, you know, do you have a tattoo honoring your mom? Do you have a tattoo honoring your dad? And it sometimes leads to an interesting conversation because quite often people, yeah, on my chest I have one honoring my mother, father, no, not so much, not uh, not common at all. That's that's the whole point. The connection to dad is spiritual, and anything spiritual has to be worked at. It's not natural. It's not biological. Right? A connection with God, that's spiritual. A connection with mom, you don't have to work at. It's like you feel it, it's right there. But not everybody automatically ends up feeling a connection to God. For certain people, for most people, it happens at a certain time. And, and many of us can even identify a date when we felt that we had now established a relationship with God. So that's what makes all the difference and... Uh, one reason that fathers are so very important, of course, um, is that there are many more religious restrictions and many more religious rituals that apply to men than apply to women. Um, for instance, uh, men have to overcome their nature to a far greater extent than women do. There is a reason that the majority of crime is committed by men. Violent crime, murders and homicides, mostly committed by men, because it's more in the nature of men to be aggressive and violent. And so when the Bible came along a little over 3,000 years ago and introduces this concept that um, violence, though obviously necessary at certain times for self-defense and for national defense, uh, is not the preferred way 
for ordinary citizens to resolve the perfectly natural disputes that will always arise when normal human beings instead of angels are living together. And that's why in order to function and in order to live as a society, we do need a system of laws and a system of fair application of those laws. That would be nice to see again. And so um, fathers are the ones who have to, if you like, buckle under the, uh, the, the yoke of God, if I can use a, a theological term. Men more than women are the ones who have to submit to a divine authority. Um, in the area of male-female relations, it is said with some degree of justification, like generalities, this one has an element of truth to it, enough that you know you will recognize the the truth aspect it is said that women seek one man to fill their many needs while men seek many women to fill their one need okay so you know you get you get the idea so when we have the 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 if you like the biblically imposed model of uh, monogamy a man marries a woman, and that's it. They're committed to one another for life, you know, short of calamities. And uh, that idea, again, would intuitively make most women say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. Um, and it would make most men say, uh -huh, what, come again? And I, uh, I sometimes sort of uh, lightheartedly think about this in terms of uh, – the th sort of speculating who came up with the idea of marriage first. In other words, if you reject the idea of a biblical revelation that introduces this shocking new idea to the world, uh, you, you might say, well, okay, yeah, you know what? Probably more a woman than a man, wouldn't you say? It would be a woman who came to a guy and said, you know, this is like Stone Age Agatha saying to Stone Age Fred, uh, I got this great idea. You forego all other women and you are only with me and uh, if and when we have babies, you look after us and take care of us and feed us and protect us. And then I say at that point, Fred is disappearing in a cloud of dust over the horizon. And poor Agatha is saying, well, I was just trying to explain to him my great idea of marriage. Yeah, that's right. It is more comfortable and natural for women than it is for men. It, 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 it's true. It's one of the reasons that so many women, and I'm sure, you know, you, you listening, there are people among you as well who who know that there are times when a man and a woman are dating and they're courting and they're seeing one another. The woman is ready. She wants to get married long before the guy does, and she doesn't know how to do it. She doesn't want to frighten him away. But and the reason is because the biblical concept of marriage fits into the female being, the female psyche. But it doesn't fit the man. For a man, marriage seems to be closing off doors. It seems to be eliminating options. It seems to be restricting my life. And so, again, it is a man who has to bow his head and submit more than a woman. And so you now you see, imagine the effect on a child. A child grows up and he sees, and as a child gets, particularly a boy, and particularly when he gets to the, uh, uh, to the age of you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, and the sap of young manhood is rising in his being, and he sees and he discovers, you know, gosh, my dad is, I realize now my dad works for us, my dad is is loyal and faithful to our mom and th that has a profound immeasurably monumental impact on a young male growing up and so a young male growing up without a father never sees a man submitting to abstract ideals and values of goodness he never sees such a thing he only sees if he sees men at all he sees men doing exactly what they feel like doing Men doing exactly what they feel like doing destroys society. It's the end of everything. Society only functions when men get, as the sociologists like to say, men get acculturated, <laughs> right? Very nice. That's true. Very good. But um, you see, it's not that simple. 
uh, when boys grow up with a father, they see a man who is willing to listen to God and do things that are against his desires and refrain from doing things that are in accordance with his desires. So the son says, I I get it. That's what being a man is. I've got to grow up like that as well. And so a married man and woman raising their children together are going to have a different quality of children that they raise. And what I've been describing applies in a slightly different way to girls they're raising as well. Bottom line is that uh, a married man and woman who are raising their children and um, raising them properly, as m- you know, most likely they are in, in most cases, in many cases, I look, there are exceptions, I get it. But uh, the quality of child raised is significantly higher, statistically speaking, than the quality of children raised by a single mom. It, just, it has to be that way, and Chuck Colson's experiment in the prisons of the United States prove that, uh, for the most part, boys raised with a mother and a father married to each other do not end up in prison. <laughs> How much clearer do you need it? Because the overwhelming majority of guys in prison don't know their fathers. Obvious. This is, I'm just giving you the background mechanism. How it works. That's kind of important, don't you think? The connection to father is spiritual. That means it's taught. And who is the most important person to teach a child his or her relationship to his or her father? Mom, of course. Nobody can be more effective than the mother at cementing the relationship between a child and its father. And uh, I've often said that the fact that I'm able to joke and say we don't celebrate Mother's Day or Father's Day in the Lapin household because every day is Mother's Day and Father's Day. Um, this is this is a big blessing. Why, why am I blessed with a close relationship with our children? Only because of Susan Lappin, right? I mean, I, I can do the best I can, and I certainly tried to do the best of I, I can, and I, I know I fell short in, in many areas, but the fact that I have a great relationship for which I'm so grateful uh, is because of my wife. She made that happen, and um, and that's really crucial. Who teaches young women today that part of their job is to make sure that their children have a connection to their husband? Who teaches them that? I don't know. I just don't know if that happens. I, I know it doesn't happen in gigs in government indoctrination camps, you know, children serve out 12 years in those camps and they come out with no knowledge and no understanding of money and no knowledge and no understanding of male-female relationships. Oh, they know the biology, all right? You don't have to worry about that. They know 27 different ways of intimate relations of many different kinds and styles. That they know. But to really understand the depth of the relationship, what a male-female relationship is, how it works, no. Uh, And, you know, when when something is done consistently, it's usually not a coincidence. And because this is so consistent throughout America, no education on male-female relationships in K through 12, no education on... uh, on financial and monetary matters, I can only assume that it is by design and intent. What could possibly be the reason for the design and the intent? Uh, Making people dependent. People who have no relationship, no understanding of male-female relationships, are unlikely to be able to form lasting marriages and families, which means they're far more likely to need social services and uh, and relief services and welfare services, which is precisely what a government headed in the wrong direction wants. They want a populace that will vote them consistently and reliably in power because they are dependent. And this is one of the reasons that uh, one of the strongest support demographics for the Democratic Party are single mothers. I mean, it should all make sense, right? Married women, women who have husbands and children, do not support the Democratic Party. Everybody knows that. The Democratic Party knows that. They don't even waste time trying to get those people. Um, and it was it bothered people in 2016. 
Why did so many women support Donald Trump? Don't they know what an evil, horrible, misogynistic person? Yeah, these are all married women with children, and they knew that Donald Trump was pro-family and uh, was going to uh, make sure that the, 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 the issues important to them would be on the forefront of his uh, concerns. And, and that's really how it is. And the, uh, the attempt on the part of government to try and get people to associate with Marxist categories is defeated only by family. And that is why uh, the majority of women who are married with children, their interests align much more with their husbands, a man, than their interests align with other women. And you, it, it, you think about it, it's pretty obvious, right? How hard is that to understand? Now, um, let's uh, try and tie it together with what we've been looking at in terms of estrangement, where uh, about a quarter of Americans are disconnected, isolated, have estranged themselves from their parents. Um, so, look, um, it's, it's very interesting. For one thing, um, the uh, COVID epidemic... Uh, pandemic, scamdemic, uh, the the COVID period uh, also contributed to this because very often uh, woke younger people were dedicated to wearing masks and isolating and quarantining, whereas very often their parents, the grandparents of their kids, were a little bit older, a little bit more experienced in life and a lot more skeptical of government restrictions, and uh, many young people used that period to cut off relationships with their parents. And we're only doing it to save you. We don't want to, we we don't want our children to infect you uh, with with the virus of COVID. But what they were really saying is, we don't want you to infect our children with a virus of your thinking. And this became a very widespread movement in America that COVID served as the excuse to separate um, grandparents from their grandchildren. So that, that was definitely one thing. Um, another thing is that uh, you you got to see something really important here, and I, I want to try and explain it <clears throat> as, as reliably and as effectively as I possibly can. And that is that... Uh, it is very important in living a successful life and in making your family grow effectively and in making your finances grow and in making your friendships nurtured and successful and making your fitness and your faith, it's very, very important to have a relationship in time that is realistic. The last thing you want to do is be an orphan of time. An orphan of time means you only have a relationship with the present. And yet that is the sad and baleful legacy of secularism very often. Because past and future are kind of spiritual. You, you can't see the past in front of you. You can see symbols of the past called statues and monuments but those are so easy to tear down and destroy. You can't see the future. You have to imagine it. You have to think about it. You're using a spiritual ability to see the future. You're using a spiritual ability to see the past. But the present is all here and it's fun. I can indulge my appetites in the here and now. I can have whatever I want. I can have whomever I want because it's all in the here and now. The, um, the uh, late rock singing star Meatball, you might remember... He, he did a song, I think it's one of the longest songs in pop history, called Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And um, uh, I think uh, it, um, 
uh, it, it must have been about seven minutes or something. At any rate, that was a really interesting song because it's the uh, the song of of a young man living in the present and he's in a car parked over a lake with his girlfriend. They're both 16 or 17 years. I think the song says they're nearly 17. And uh, <clears throat> he's, he's pushing and pushing and pushing. And she finally says, stop, stop. Uh, we're not going further until you tell me if you'll love me forever, love me for the rest of your life and make me your wife. That's what she's insisting on. And he is torn between his hormones and a, a shred of decency that still lingers in his being. But finally, he says, OK, fine, I promise, I promise, I promise. And there's a really, I, I think, a clever insertion into the song of the narration of a baseball game. And again, any, anybody who, um, who remembers his youth uh, or her youth will probably remember the terms first base and second base and third base and so on in terms of male-female relationships. I won't say any more on the show for the moment, but you, you get the idea. And they sort of have that in the middle of the song, which tells you where they're at. And, um, and then finally, Meatball sings, uh, they go for it. And then the song moves ahead a number of years. And he says, look, I kept my word. I wasn't going to break my promise. And we, yes, we got married. And I hate the side of her. And she echoes. Then she says she hates the side of him. And he's just waiting basically for the end of time so he doesn't have to be with her anymore. But um, that idea that there is a future is so rare, particularly in the, the pop world. And I think part of the reason it became such a classic, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, uh, is because it gave a hint of the future, whereas normally uh, pop music eliminates the future. It stops you having to think about the future. That's part of its appeal. And, uh, and so it is that um, most entertainment that people see on their screens, most, uh, most, most stuff that people watch on streaming services – it's stuff that stops you thinking about the future, stops you thinking about the past for the most part. The, the past is less problematic. It's still problematic, but the future is what really is difficult to think about. And yet, for successful living, um, whether it's financial or family-wise, I mean, the one thing you want to make sure that a teenage boy or girl begin to get a sense of an understanding of is the future because a clear, strong understanding of the future will help to restrain them from terrible mistakes and help to encourage them move, moving forward in the right direction. And again, any parent of a teenager, first of all, if you're sending your teenager to a gig, so then, you know, I'm sorry, but the odds are really stacked up against you. But if you're homeschooling or you're sending them to a, uh, a good private school, or for that matter, to be perfectly honest, if you're not sending them to school at all and just let them give them access to books and make sure they can read, uh, all of that is superior to what is going on in, uh, in GICs, government indoctrination camps, previously known as public schools. Well, uh, it's so it's um, it, it's it's. It's the one thing you'd want to get across to them, isn't it? Hey, past and future really matter. You've got to understand, even though we have to use spiritual powers to understand the future, because you can't see it. You've got to think about it. You've got to imagine it. And the past, you've also got to use spiritual powers. I want to tell you about the values of this family. I want to tell you uh, where mommy came from, and I want to tell you where daddy came from. I want to tell you about your grandparents. You may never have met them, maybe, but here's who they were, here are the things, the way they lived their life, and you are part of this chain of transmission. Look at the name you carry. You carry your father's name. So we're teaching past and we're teaching future as well. This is absolutely vital, so vital, in fact, that uh, in the Lord's language, in Hebrew, the uh, main Hebrew name for God Almighty is made up of the Hebrew words for past, present, and future. That's one of the reasons that we say God is timeless, right? 
past, present, all wrapped up. And so part of becoming godly is becoming someone for whom the past and the future are just as important as the present. That's so important to understand. Past and future are as important as the present. The problem with secularism is that it is very difficult to inculcate a sense of past and future in a secular person. You might say, well, we'll teach them history. Yeah, but the trouble is that uh, history taught under secular auspices is not only value-free, but it's often value-distorted. And uh, future is not taught at all because that's considered to be imposing a belief system. That's right, you see. You can't possibly teach the future if you don't first establish the moral framework in which you are looking at the future. Just think about that for a few minutes. I'll say it again if you don't mind. You can't possibly think about the future till you have first of all decided through the lens of what moral framework will you think of the future. See? I think you'll, you'll see how important that becomes. Now, one of the things that all tyrannical regimes always do is they try and cut off relations between people and their parents and their past. Because once you have isolated people from their past, you can then design their future. And this is basic to revolutionary theology. Uh, and whatever revolution, whether you're looking at America 2023 or whether you're looking at uh, previous regimes, but the attempt always focuses, and you always know a government is up to no good when it tries to isolate people from their past. And there are a number of ways of doing this. One of the ways, and um, you, you may think to yourself this is a far fetch, but it isn't, and that is um, impose a, as close as you can get to 100% inheritance tax. Now, never mind the immorality of taxing monies that have already had taxes paid on them. In other words, right, you know, a person earns $1,000 a month for 12 months a year and for 20 years, you know, and at the end of that period, he's got a lot of money and it's all had taxes paid on it. And now he dies. And instead of his children getting it, the government takes a whole slice of it as an inheritance tax. So it's double taxing money. But that's not the point. The point isn't just money gathering. The reason governments do this is to help destroy the relationship between parents and children. That's right. Family and finance are strongly connected. Do you know that marriages in which a husband and wife share finances, where they use a joint banking account, are healthier and stronger than families that don't? Money is really, really important. Marriages in which the father makes the money and the mother makes the home are statistically far happier and far more durable than families that work differently. I understand the realities of life today. Believe me, I totally get it. But that doesn't stop me from wanting to tell you the truth. And so as hard as it is to do today, be aware that families in which father works outside the house and brings home the money and mom builds a home and provides a haven of security in which her husband can be a man, happier marriages, more successful marriages, more durable marriages, marriages in which the finances are joint do much better than marriages in which they don't. Finance and family are connected. Please remember that. And uh, the, uh, that same truth applies when it comes to parents and children. The fact that a parent supplies the financial needs of a child by working is hugely important. You have a totally different family structure, much less successful, much less lasting when the, the family is provided for by the government. 
families on the dole do not endure. That's if they get onto the dole in the first place. Generally speaking, they don't. But even when they do, children who know they're being fed by the government as opposed to being fed by their parents, very big difference in the relationship between parents and children. Some people wanted to make, oh, it's money. You know, who wants to introduce the vulgarity of money to the beauty of a parent-child relationship? You're missing the point. It's a very important part of it. It's very, very valuable that the father or the mother give money to the children, usually in return for jobs done or chores done or whatever it is. You, you have a wise system of disbursing money. You don't just give money. But the fact that money comes from parent to child, hugely important. And the fact at the end of parents' lives that, the, uh, that there is an uninterrupted, unimpeded uh, flow of assets from late parent to child, hugely important. And in biblical terms, it's, it's actually known because in biblical terms, it's actually laid out exactly how it goes from parent to child. So it's not as if the child lives his life saying, or her life, hey, I wonder if, uh, if I'm going to be included in the will. No, you, you know you will be. This is part of how the relationship works. It's part of how um, human beings are incentivized in the godly system to work hard because I'm going to work very, very differently if I know that whatever's left over at the end of my time goes to my children than if I think that whatever's left over at the end of my time goes to the government and to every all other children. <laughs> no, it's different. I'm much more incentivized to work hard in the first case than in the second. And these are, you know, what can I tell you? These are really, really crucial things that uh, we all do need to understand very, very well, and we need to understand them at the right stage of life, if you don't mind. So estrangement from parents is yet another way of uh, cutting ties with the past. And when you've cut your ties with the past, it becomes harder to see the future, not easier. And that's why one of the reasons that, uh, that men with wives and children do better financially, and I've, I've covered the stats on this in the past, uh, men with wives and children do much better than single men, business-wise, for the most part, um, is because their children give them a constant glimpse into the future. And seeing the future is vitally important in business because you do have to foresee trends to, to be successful in business. Clearly, you have to see um, or at least hear the soft footsteps of approaching events. You, that, that, at the very least, you have to be able to understand. And so the whole world of therapists, by the way, therapists today drive people apart. Am I generalizing? Yes, because it's not true for all therapists. It's only true for 96 out of 100 therapists. And uh, they do drive people apart. Therapists spend a lot of their time telling their clients how the, your parents ruined your life. That's a big topic in therapy. And by the way, if, if for one reason or another you are in therapy, and I discourage it strongly, but if you are, then uh, the minute the therapist starts talking about how your parents ruined your life, please get up and walk out. You're having your time and your money wasted, and you're not only not being helped, but you're actually being harmed because you need a relationship with your parents. The last thing you want to happen is for your parents to leave this world without you connected with them. Uh, it's not, not for their purposes. It's nice for them too, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that for you to be an orphan in time, for you to let your parents leave with you in a state of estrangement, you'll never recover from. I'm sorry. All the therapy in the world won't fix that. So please be aware, if you are among those estranged, go ahead and repair it. Go ahead and, while there's time, go ahead and fix that. Not for their sake, for yours, because we need a connection with the past. And I'm afraid your parents are your primary connection with the past. Uh, I can't think of a better way to do it. So uh, you want to leapfrog them, leapfrog them and go to your grandparents? Fine, if you can do that. But you do need that connection to the past, not just through your mother, but through your father as well. So look, I know this has been a, a heavy show today. It's a, a lot of hard information, but 
I know that happy warriors can handle it. Make sure you subscribe. I'd appreciate that. And uh, make sure you become a happy warrior and uh, visit the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, if you are still among that tiny minority of people who do not own a copy of the Bible, make sure you get yourself a copy of Rabbi Daniel Lappin's recommended Bible, which you will find in the store on rabbidaniellappin.com website. Until we get together next time, I hope that you have a blessed and positive week, a week in which you move only onwards and upwards in your family and in your finances, in your faith, in your friendship, and in your fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.